Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Nardone. I'm director and co-founder of Biotrack. Welcome to our Thursday weekly webinar series. Uh, we're excited to be doing this again. We did a series in the spring that was very well received. We had over 2,200 uh, registration, event registrations for that series, and we thought we'd go ahead and, and do it again. For those who might not be familiar with our program, Biotrack offers hands-on training workshops for research scientists. These workshops are team taught by active researchers and they focus on the latest, latest relevant techniques that are necessary for laboratory research and are open to the scientific community. Originally, we were based at the National Institutes of Health for 30 years and now we're located at the Montgomery College Germantown campus, the Bioscience Education Center. And since we started the program, we have trained close to 18,000 scientists uh, coming through our workshops. Currently, we offer 25 different uh, offerings. Uh, these are in a live instruction uh, remote format, which includes lecture presentation, laboratory demonstration, protocol review, and discussion. Under this format, attendees have the option, if so desired, to come back and receive the in-person hands-on experience later in the year when the workshop is offered again. Along with these hands-on uh, training programs, we continue to serve the scientific community through custom design training programs, bio panel networking events, weekly webinar series, symposiums, hosting government and industry retreats as well, or, as, well as other key annual scientific events such as outreach initiatives uh, with like the Maryland Science Olympiad. We're a sponsor and uh, 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 co-active in that, uh, that arena. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Alyssa Dillman. Dr. Dillman serves as a training strategist for the Center for Information Technology, CIT, Cloud Services team in support of the National Institutes of Health Strides Initiative. Dr. Dillman is focused on enabling the utilization of cloud capabilities by generating training content relevant to the biomedical community and creating such events, events such as codathons. Dr. Dillman also serves as an outreach coordinator for the Office of Data Strategy, Science Strategy, ODSS, at the NIH. And I've had the pleasure of working with Alyssa for the past five years, as she is a key contributor to our Biotrack program, lecturing and presenting in our R for Research Scientists and other next-gen related uh, workshops, such as our single cell RNA-seq program. These workshops have provided hands-on instruction to over 400 research scientists from local, national, and international institutions. So without further ado, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alyssa Dillman and talking about biodata research, codathons, what they are and why we do them. Alyssa, they're all yours. All right, thank you very much, Mark. So first I'd like to start off with a, um, a definition or sort of a, a working definition for what a hackathon is, um, at least the way that we run them. So these hackathons are for scientists and coders and everyone in between. We have everyone from clinicians to hobbyist coders to software engineers to chemists to biologists and data scientists and everyone in between. So they're, they're really meant to be pretty, pretty uh, uh, inclusive. The what of a hackathon is the idea is to build tools and answer, answer meaningful questions in the biomedical community. And why do we run hackathons? We run them for expertise sharing and collaboration. Now, I tend to think of hackathons as having kind of these three uh, pinnacle pieces. So I, I drew it as a triangle here. And there's sort of the creation aspect. And that's, you know, what are you trying to build, whether it's tools, a white paper, publication, a tutorial. You know, you're, you're creating something in your hackathon. There's the collaboration aspect, you know, so the, the thing that's unique about a hackathon as opposed to, you know, business as usual is it's really about bringing people together from disparate backgrounds, from disparate career tracks, from different places in um, the research community, you know, so not just academia, but also in industry and in, um, you know, software and things like that. So it's really about this, this networking and building of, of collaborative effort. And then finally, there's the educational component. So this kind of comes in a couple of different flavors. So often we have um, little demos and um, hands-on uh, little mini workshops within the hackathon. So you get education in that slightly more formal setting. But we also talk about education in terms of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So oftentimes on your team, you'll be learning from each other because you're bringing those different backgrounds 
uh, together. So you'll have sort of different views on tools and how to answer said questions. So there's a lot of peer to peer education happening as well. And the cool thing about the hackathon tool or that the, the hackathon event is that depending on what you're most interested in, you can sort of wait more towards you know one of these triangle edges so all hackathons have some sort of compilation of these three things but you can kind of weight them depending on what's most important so for interest for for example if you're um if you've got a data set that you really want people to utilize in new ways the first thing that you have to do is you have to kind of educate them about what's contained within that data set how it's been used before so that you're going to weight a lot more towards that educational component um, you know, if you already have creation of some software, but now you want people to build on it, you want people to, to utilize it, you want people to take it and build it uh, more for their own specific community, then you're going to lead more toward that creation. If you're more interested in, say, you know, there are communities that you haven't engaged with before, and you really want to get their, their feedback, their input, and get them engaged, then you're going to lean a lot more towards that collaborative aspect of things. So this is kind of what's really powerful about this, this tool is that it's really quite flexible. So a hackathon, at, at the heart of a hackathon, it's really about this idea of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is basically, you know, getting input and feedback and ideas from the community in which you're trying to interact with and build for or build with. Um, and we, we utilize this crowdsourcing techniques in actually a couple different ways in, in our hackathons. So first and foremost, uh, the project pitches are coming from um, the community itself. So oftentimes we may have the overarching topic or overarching data set that's brought to us by a particular entity, um, but the idea for what to do with that topic or that data set is completely given by the community at large. So the, the projects are pitched from people looking at it from, from that, that community perspective. So all of those ideas are completely new um, and, 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 and interesting. And then the second part of crowdsourcing is about the participation itself. So again, you know, we all of our events are in, open to everyone in the public. So we get participation from people all over um, you know, the spectrum in, in terms of, uh, you know, what their background is and what they're cur currently doing in their career trajectory. So we get a lot of really interesting um, people with interesting backgrounds. And there's a lot of reasons why utilizing crowdsourcing and, and utilizing a hackathon event is really powerful. So obviously, um, you know, the one that people are most familiar with is this idea of generating software, right? So, so one reason why people will run a hackathon is because they're really interested in um, creating novel software to answer their particular question. Um, however, there's other reasons why people run hackathons as well. So as I mentioned before, if they have a new data set or they have a data set that's become a bit stagnant, um, you know, or a database, um, you know, they can kind of promote that by running a hackathon um, and, you know, getting crowdsourcing pitched ideas for new ways of using it, new tools to utilize it. Um, another really useful thing that you get from a hackathon as someone who's running a hackathon is you really get to understand uh, user base knowledge. So, for instance, if you have, you know, a data set or a tool and you're trying to understand what people are doing with it, how they're using it, where they're getting stuck, what their pain points are, why they may use somebody else's tool instead of yours. Um, you'll learn a lot of these things in a hackathon because people will, you know, the, these sorts of issues will come out and, and you'll get to see people working on them in real time on real problems. So you'll learn a lot from your community running a hackathon. And then finally, um, you know, you, as I've mentioned in the previous slide, you really truly get this community engagement. So you get a lot of people coming in that may not otherwise interact with you, with your products, with your scientific question, with your interests. So that community engagement, that network building, that um, you know, ability to sort of reach across to other communities that you don't interact with, this is a really powerful um, uh, and useful part of, of a hackathon. <clears throat> so because I'm from NIH, um, I did want to sort of 
point out that um, you know all of, or at least a large portion of NIH um, does engage in these uh, these types of events. So NIH is actually comprised of 27 different institutes, and 16 out of those 20 different institutes have partnered with us or had um, participated in our hackathons. And here they're also sized based on how much uh, participation they have in, in hackathon events. But we don't just run these things at NIH, we also go out and do community engagement to the broader biomedical community in general as well. So we go to universities um, and we partner with universities uh, for, for running these events. So um, we also partner with conferences. So for instance, um, minus this year <laughs> because of COVID, uh, we've worked with BioIT uh, World Conference the last three years and we've run a fair hackathon with them. Um, we've gone to the New York Genome Center, we've gone to UT Southwestern, um, and we've also had hackathons that end up spawning off and then kind of keep running their own hackathon after we've helped them get up and started. So, so HackSeq is one of those examples where we worked with them, they're based in Vancouver, um, they ran, we ran a hackathon kind of with them that first time around and they've really like went off um, and running with it and it's now its own entity, its own program. Um, so this is sort of like an invitation to say, you know, if you have a particular idea, data set, question you're trying to answer, software you're trying to build, you know, let us know and, you know, we can, we can either help you sort of build a hackathon, build a workshop, or at least kind of help consult with you on what the best ways are to create an event that's going to be most useful for the goals that you're trying to achieve. So hackathons have a really broad um, set of topics that they can cover. Um, I'm, I'm focusing a little more on the bioinformatics and data science aspects in this particular slide, but it's, it is even broader than this. So um, I'm going to put these into a couple of basic uh, or broader, sorry, pillars. So for instance, we do a lot of omics analysis. So that's, you know, everything from NGS to proteomics to metabolomics. Um, we have done projects and, and hackathons around tax mining. So that encourage that includes things like metadata, publication mining data, or sorry, mining publication data, uh, mining clinical data, mining bioassays. Um, we've done things such as build tutorials. So as I've mentioned, hackathons aren't just building about building software, it's about making things that make it easier for the community to, to do their work. And oftentimes that means training and tutorials. So we've built things like, uh, you know, biomed specific containers, workflows, toolkits, Jupyter notebooks that are followable long after the event and knowledge collection. So, you know, some of our hackathon projects have even just been, let's look for all the tools that are involved in single cell analysis, you know, and that, that's, that was a hackathon uh, project. Um, we've also done things such as image, imaging analysis, and that can include microscopy and clinical imaging, such as uh, MRIs and CT scans. And then we have sort of, I, I put this in kind of a, a, a lump together uh, topic as well as, as just data science broadly. Um, and that can include things like data reformatting, data parsing, visualization, ways of automating things that we normally are used to doing by hand. Um, but also about process, you know, taking something that you've done with a bespoke data set, a small data set, and then figuring out a way to apply that to massive data sets. Oops. So not only are we interested in a diversity of topics in our hackathons, but we're also interested in diversity of participation. And I don't just mean diversity of participation in that they're from different backgrounds, such as biology or, you know, clinicians or software engineers. I also mean in terms of diversity of the participants themselves. So one thing that um, hackathons, and, and now here I'm using the word codathon, um, and that's because uh, we, we've recently had to shift to the, the use of the word codathon in the federal government. Um, however, hackathons and codathons are the same thing. It's just in the government, we, we need to use the word codathon rather than hackathon. Um, so anyway, so we want, uh, that there, there is a tendency for hackathons to skew 
uh, very much towards male participation. And we didn't want our events to have that same bias. So we really had a long think about, you know, what was the best way to improve diversity of engagement in our events. And so um, for about a year, we, we reached out to a lot of different women's coding and women's scientist groups to um, talk about, you know, what would be the best, best way to get more women engaged in, in data science and computing and bioinformatics, generally speaking. Uh, and it actually, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm the, the hackathon. I always like, there's a problem, hackathon will solve it. But this time it was actually a little bit the other way around. We were, we were approaching these communities more to ask, you know, what can we do to get women more engaged in, in computing? And the codeathon was actually what, what came out of their suggestion. So we engaged with a bunch of different communities. And as I mentioned before, um, both science and coding communities, but here I sort of gave an example of a couple of the women's coding communities that are both, um, some are local. So DC Femtech is local, Hear Me Code is local, but also international groups such as our, um, our ladies and Pi ladies and women who code. So we engaged a lot of these underrepresented communities and we really, uh, you know, talked about what they need, where they're at, where they're going. And at the end of the day, we come up with this, came up with this women-led codeathon, and we had 46 scientists and coders uh, participate in this event. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, we had eight new software tools. Uh, we had uh, manuscripts come out of the event and posters. Um, some of the women presented at other conferences work that they continued to work on. Um, so it was a really um, interesting and uh, powerful event. And I think this really illustrates that, you know, codeathons are a really useful way to engage and broaden community participation. And if you're interested, you can also check out more. There was um, a, a little blog article about the women-led codeathon uh, here. The other thing I wanted to sort of pull out was a specific project example, just because again, I think this really illustrates that, you know, these aren't just about uh, answering uh, you know, biomedical data questions, but it's also asking questions about our community in general. So this particular project, um, it wasn't in the women-led codeathon specifically. This was a project in a in a different codeathon we ran, um, and they were specifically investigating uh, the acknowledgement sections of of publications in PMC. So the project was entitled Hidden Figures, and basically they. Um, they did a whole bunch of um, analysis of the acknowledgement sections on a research publication. And they had kind of this hypothesis that, you know, we, we already know there's a bias in um, gender representation in authorship. You know, maybe there's a bias in the other direction for acknowledgement. The hypothesis they had was that, you know, perhaps there are fewer authors that are female, but maybe they're acknowledged more. So they're not really given um, as much credit. Um, however, they, you know, they found that yet they did find that there was a authorship bias, but they also found that there's a huge uh, acknowledgement bias. So there are a lot fewer women who are acknowledged in the acknowledgement section. Um, they also found, interestingly, there's this uh, tendency for unigender acknowledgement. So 80% of the papers acknowledge men and only men. Um, so that was really interesting. And then the other thing that they did is they, they tried to pull out how the acknowledgement was described. And so that's what this, um, this word cloud is. So it was about, um, you know, men are often uh, associated with words like provide, allow, um, you know, dedicate, Whereas for women, it wasn't really about their work per se. It was, you know, more about, you know, just thank you for your time, but not really anything specific like it was for men. I mean, like the provide one really jumped out at me because we really do in our society have this bias towards, you know, men being providers. And so it was really interesting that people acknowledged men by using the word provide. Anyway, I thought that this was kind of a cool uh, way to demonstrate that um, hackathons can, can really investigate interesting um, uh, questions around, you know, what affects our communities. Another way that we've run, um, we've run hackathons is by uh, creating tracks. 
and then iterating over those track numerous times. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, hackathons are, are these kind of bursts of work, you know, they're two or three days. You don't necessarily finish everything you wanted to finish, obviously, in like a three day time period. So at NCBI, um, which is under the National Library of Medicine at NIH, uh, we devised four tracks that we would iterate over. So we have um, these four tracks and they're about virus discovery. Um, and we actually uh, have a publication associated with each of these tracks now. Um, so there's virus characterization and discovery, RNA-seq analysis visualization, computational genomics, and pangenomic and genomic graphs. And as I said, there's associated papers with each of these. And the nice thing we've noticed about tracks is we do, um, you know, we're, we're more likely to finish projects because we can iterate over multiple events. So, you know, we had multiple hackathons all about this specific subject and this specific data, and we were, you know, able to start to, to actually finish parts of that puzzle and then publish on them. So tracks can be a really useful way um, if, if, you know, creation is your main goal in a hackathon, a track, an iterative track can be a useful tool in that space. Um, the other thing I want to share uh, and that I think is really useful if you're going to run a hackathon is to make sure whatever work is done is findable and reusable so that way people can build on it, use it. And we do these, this production and knowledge sharing in two ways. So we've created a um, codeathon organization in GitHub. So GitHub is a place where um, people can share code and software. Um, so we have an organization and each project gets its own repository where they can put their code, they can put their um, small dummy data. Uh, it's not meant for large data. And you know, they're, um, sort of their workflow, their uh, reasoning behind what they're doing. So that's, that's one place that we can find all of the projects and products being done. So for instance, in, in NCBI, their Codeathon repository has over 300 different projects in it. So 300 different, uh, you know, outputs. And then the other thing is, you know, at the end of the day, publication for better or worse is the sort of, um, the currency in science. So we also have uh, publications that we work on um, and a lot of them are in F1000, but as I showed you in the last slide, not all of them, we had one in genes for instance, um, but we have like a track specifically for hackathons and F1000. So that's another way that we can share how we're running these events and what we're getting out of them. So the last couple slides are kind of just parting summarizations and, um, you know, sort of lessons learned in some ways of, of uh, how we've been running them. So I, I ran over 40 hackathons over the last couple of years. Um, so I really feel like I've gotten a good um, broad picture of, of how useful these things are, how they can be applied and, and when things go wrong, why they go wrong. So the first thing I want to sort of really hit home is about this idea of continuous engagement. So the, the really important thing about hackathons is about building community recognition and trust. So at the end of the day, the beauty of hackathons is that you're getting people to come together that don't work together. Um, you know, they're not even in the same spaces and they're going to build something together. And if you don't have trust, and you don't have um, community buy-in, it's gonna feel like they're working for you for free, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a, you know, they're not getting paid for this work. This is something they do in their own time or else, you know, maybe they can convince their, their work that it at least helps them learn something so they can, they can join. But at the end of the day, like this is not something that's, you know, part of their normal work week, part of their normal, um, uh, their, their normal work schedule. So, if, if we're not careful about how we engage our community and we're not careful about how we present what's gonna happen with their work, um, you know, we're gonna lose that trust. So, so building trust, building recognition, building um, you know, a true community is really important. And to do that, you need this sort of in continuous engagement where you touch back, you touch forward. Um, the interesting thing that we've learned from running hackathons is we, we 
get this kind of constant evaluation of scientific and computational needs. You know, part of what's really the strength about crowdsourcing is, you know, rather than us coming up with ideas, it's coming from the community itself. So, you know, they're always going to be on sort of the cutting edge of what's new, what's out there, you know, um, you know, much better than any one person or any one entity could be because they're coming from all over the place. So we, we, we constantly get this information, which means if we're good about being engaged with our community, that means we need constant evaluation of, you know, what our topics are, what our data sets are, what our tools are. So it should be an iterative process with our community. Um, finally, we've learned that, you know, Again, when we were running these things in person, for sure, especially, although, um, although now that we've done them remote, we do tend to spread them out over a longer period of time. Um, but when we were doing them in person, you know, we, these events are two or three days long most of the time. And so that's a very compressed schedule. Um, you know, and it's also with people you've never worked with before. Um, so we've really learned that you want to create an environment and give them as many tools and remove as many obstacles as possible for them to be productive and creative on this compressed schedule. The other thing that I wanted to mention was, um, so, you know, as we're constantly iterating on running these events, um, we have uh, challenges that we need to address. So some of the things that we've learned is when we engage the team leads, so team leads are the people that pitch the project to us, generally speaking. Um, when we engage these folks uh, in advance, it's much easier to sort of capture their technical needs, to capture their, um, you know, goals and success metrics ahead of time. That way we can work with them back and forth to give them the environment they need ahead of time so they're not spending the entire codathon just trying to build their compute environment or you know download their data or whatever it is they need to do if we can capture those needs and get those all prepared ahead of time you know when people come together they can just go answer the question they need to without having to deal with a lot of these um, you know technical nitty-gritty bits the other uh, reason for engaging team leads ahead of time is you know oftentimes the projects that are pitched are they're amazing projects, but scientists and, and you know software engineers, you know, we tend to think of projects in these large overarching, you know, one, two, three, five year projects. And we're not used to thinking about things that can be done in such a short time frame. So oftentimes engaging the team leads ahead of time to help them kind of scope their projects to um, things that are going to actually be achievable in two, three days has led to a lot more success, a lot more cohesion and a lot more um, satisfaction in the events. Um, as I mentioned, we create sandboxes uh, for cloud computing. Um, so that way they can explore, uh, you know, how to utilize cloud if they want to utilize cloud. Um, the nice thing about cloud computing is they now have a shared uh, computing environment versus working on their own machines. This is hugely of benefit when we're running them virtually because you can no longer look over each other's shoulder when you're coding something because you're, you're not physically together. So having a shared computing environment or Jupyter Notebook or something um, really helps with uh, virtual hackathons. And then finally, uh, working toward creating multi-purpose documentation. So what I mean by that is you know, creating documentation that can be used for running a hackathon, that can be used for running a workshop, that can be used for running training, um, you know, making these things modular so they're reusable. And then finally, the, the thing that's the most fun but also the hardest about running hackathons is it's really about this balance of having just the right amount of structure so people can, you know, do the work they need to do, but remaining flexible and creative enough because at the end of the day, in hackathons, there's a lot of pivoting. There's a lot, everything's very fast moving. Um, you know, and, and the whole point of a hackathon is about this creative energy. So you want enough structure that there's, you know, sort of a foundation, but not that there's guardrails so tight that you don't have that uh, creativity. And then finally, I just want to end with um, some sort of ideas that we have for what I'm calling a, as ongoing integration of uh, hackathon events into full programs. 
So as I mentioned um, with the NCBI example, you know, we're really working on this idea of pipeline iteration. So taking a project and running it through multiple hackathons to complete the project, to add to the project, and, and to iterate on it. Um, and that's been really successful and, and we wanna continue to grow that out. Um, when we started these events, they were originally like a little more focused on just the, the software building itself, but we've, we've really sort of opened out into actually trying to solve novel scientific problems as well. So not just about building something for analysis, but actually thinking about, you know, novel ways of utilizing analysis tools to actually answer scientific problems. Um, as I mentioned, we have partnered with conferences in the past. We would like to expand that. We find that to be really useful, especially if the topic that you're interested in is a little bit niche. So for example, if you're only interested in single cell RNA-seq, you know, there's gonna be a smaller subset of people that can um, actually handle that data and, and uh, participate in a hackathon. So rather than trying to gather them all to you, if you go to a conference, for instance, that's about single cell data and you run a hackathon there, you're gonna get all the people that you need to run a successful event. Um, we want to expand out and explore uh, novel data types and topics. I mean, I did tell you we have a pretty broad set of topics, but um, you know, continuing to expand and try new topics uh, will, will help us kind of learn when we finally meet our threshold of what's not a useful topic for a hackathon. Um, and then finally, um, better integration with education programs. And we've started this um, by, uh, we've added training to uh, like one or two days of training before a hackathon now. So training for you know, either specific biomedical tools or data sets or just computing in general. Um, we've actually utilized hackathons as capstones um, for training projects. So the flip side, rather than having training and then a hackathon, people have had, um, uh, so sorry, rather than training for a hackathon, we've had people go through like a 16 week, you know, data science course or boot camp, And then the hackathon is kind of like their capstone project where they can now apply what they've learned in their class to something a lot more open-ended and creative. Um, and then finally, we have our eyes on a bring your own data type of event where, um, you know, rather than using uh, published data, you know, bring your data and we'll figure out how to get you working on analysis and things like that. So those are some of the ideas that we've either partially explored or have yet to explore. Uh, but that's what I want to leave you with. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, and if you have, you know, more questions or you're interested in uh, hackathon topics, you can check out um, the website here, but also um, NCBI, the one I gave you earlier. And then if you're interested in specific questions for me, uh, you can reach me, my team at dsoutreach at nih.gov. Um, and I can, you can also email me directly if you like, I can put my email in the chat. All right, Alyssa, outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, on Monday, we'll be uh, sending out a link to this presentation uh, along with uh, a copy of the uh, presentation. And I'll be sure to put uh, Alyssa's contact information in the email that you'll receive on Monday. Um, I'll go through a couple of questions that's in the Q&A, but if, can you give me an idea of uh, maybe the last two or three uh, pitches that have come your way? Uh, what, what do you typically see? Um, I mean, it, it really depends on sort of the overarching topic we have. So the last hackathon uh, I ran was with the Cold Spring Harbor uh, Data Science Conference in November. Um, so that one was really broad because it was literally like all of data science. Um, but we do still tend to see more on the NGS side of things. So people are still uh, pretty focused on omics data more often than not. Um, as you're talking about partnering with conferences, we do a immuno-oncology multiplexing conference uh, each September with AstraZeneca at the BEC and, uh, you know, uh, hoping that we're back in person at that time, but it's usually 100 scientists or so who are there. Uh, maybe we should talk and add that because I know a component of multiplexing is AI. Uh, and and the automated analysis and, and maybe we can put something uh, together in relation to that. So we'll, we'll talk further regarding that. 
Yeah, oh. and machine learning is also, I mean, as you bring it up, machine learning is a really big topic that we're seeing a lot more um, projects being pitched on. So machine learning, AI, um, and then uh, a lot of people are really moving towards Jupyter Notebooks and, and creating workflows and, and really simple to use Jupyter Notebooks. Very good. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, Hidden Figures uh, hackathon results, uh, were they published? And can you uh, uh, email me or put in the chat what the uh, <coughs> title of the author was from? Sure. So they they did do a, they did work on a publication. Um, interestingly, that one didn't uh, end up being submitted for publication. There was some pushback in interesting ways, but I can definitely give you the uh, the GitHub link for the project. Okay, yeah, uh, email to me. Uh, I know the person asking the question, I can forward it along, no problem at all. Sure, yeah. Are there any other questions from the participants? Uh, okay, Carla, I see your uh, 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 note also. I'll make sure you go ahead and get that information. I can actually probably look it up really quick while you're asking if they have other questions. <laughs> like quick, right. fill, fill. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's easy enough. Uh, while uh, Alyssa is checking on that, uh, I will thank you everyone for uh, in attending this morning's program, I should say afternoon program, and you hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have the recording uh, ready to go Monday as well as a PDF of the presentation. And please join us next week uh, for a presentation by Dr. Marina Dvorskaya, who is with uh, NIH NCI. I'm talking about immunological properties of engineered nanomaterials. Uh, it'll be a fascinating presentation. She does, uh, she's an expert, a uh, uh, department lead in that area, and uh, you'll be in good hands. I know that uh, we work with Marina in our uh, CRISPR workshop. And she looks at nanoparticles uh, as a delivery mechanism uh, uh, for CRISPR, but uh, that's just a subset of the larger talk should be getting a link in the, uh, uh, in the Q and A. So take a look at that. I'll leave the meeting as a chance to uh, cut and paste and get that information. I just realized there, there actually were a couple of questions and I missed them. I'm sorry. Would you like me to answer them real quick? Uh, oh, they're in the Q&A. Yeah, I missed them um, on the Q&A panel, my bad. Oh, I missed, yeah, no, that's on me. Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. I got a question. Um, do you establish coding standards prior to the codathon? Um, so we, we do have requirements that they uh, put everything in their GitHub repos coding wise. Um, but other than that, we don't necessarily have too many standards, um, partially because every team ends up picking sort of their own tools and their own coding language. Um, for instance, in you know the last hackathon I ran, we had a team that was exclusively in R, a team exclusively in um, Jupyter Notebooks, another team exclusively in JavaScript. So it would be kind of tricky to try to establish coding standards for, for all of those different languages, but we generally speaking, try and have um, uh, a, uh, work up of what the readme should have, what kinds of content should be in the GitHub readme and things like that. So we, we do try and give them that kind of structure. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I got another question. Can anyone participate in a codathon? Yes. Um, if you want to get involved, you can either look on the website uh, that I shared through ODSS or else through NCBI's website. Um, they have a calendar post and so do we on upcoming events. And I can put those links in here as well. Um, hold on a second. So you can kind of keep your eyes out on those. Um, basic qualification for participation. Uh, not really, no. So um, I build the teams for the event and I try and balance the teams for, um, you know, beginner, intermediate, and advanced on each team. So you don't necessarily have to be, you know, the most advanced coder or the most advanced in single cell or whatever to participate. Um, I try to, to make sure that there's, there's enough expertise of varying degrees on each team. So don't feel shy, apply. Oh my gosh, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. <laughs> um, uh, can you share links? 
to hackathons addressing COVID-19. Okay, um, that will take me a little longer because that's on a different list. There was um, back at the beginning of COVID, gosh, everybody and their mother was doing a COVID hackathon. Um, so there were a lot of them floating around, uh, which is partially why I didn't necessarily feel the need that we run one specifically at NIH. Um, because there were so many going on everywhere else. Um, and at the time, a lot of the people who would be best suited for COVID-19 hackathon were also busy doing research on COVID-19, like, and were very focused and didn't want to detract from that. Um, but I could definitely get you a list of all of the, we, we had a running list at one point of all the different COVID-19 hackathons going on, like around the country. Um, so good question there. Uh, and then the, finally, uh Oh, sorry. Uh, hang on. Uh, the person who asked that question, uh, you're listed as anonymous. So if you could uh, type your name in the Q&A so I can make sure you get the information on the uh, COVID, uh, that would be great. Go ahead, Alyssa. All right. So how often do I use the NIH, HPC, or AWS as a server? Um, so when we first started running these, uh, we used AWS, a combination of AWS and HPC at NIH. Um, so originally, so NIH has a, a high performance computer called BioWolf. Um, it originally was fairly easy for um, even the general public to utilize it. Uh, however, these days it's, it's pretty locked down. So only NIH employees can use it. Um, so because our hackathons are open to everyone, it was, it's kind of difficult now to use the, the NIH HPC specifically. Um, so we use AWS and GCP and about half of the teams, uh, do utilize the cloud computing. Um, and they definitely, we have more requests for using, uh, GCP. So the Google cloud versus AWS. Hopefully I answered everyone's questions. Does anybody need clarification or anything like that? Um, I think we're okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Jeff, you asked about it. Okay, not, not a problem. Very good. I'm making, uh, making notes, Jeff. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, Alyssa, awesome as always. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention to the group. Uh, if you, uh, when you get the link for this video, uh, we have other uh, past webinar links there. And Alyssa gave a real nice presentation on R and Tidyverse, uh, a half hour presentation uh, that was uh, extremely well uh, received. I highly recommend. So when you're bouncing around on the website, maybe take a look at that also. Uh, definitely worthwhile if uh, you're in the uh, R universe. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Take care now. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you.